Hello and welcome to Doctor Who 50 Years Ago, a show that looks back to the episode that aired in 1970 and looks at the differences between then and now. This week, Spearhead from Space, Episode 2, whose elements are a facsimile from the first episode. Oh, what a clever joke. I am Ben. I'm Luke. And I'm Nick. And here we are, and here we go, into the news from 1970. On Sunday, the 4th of January, NASA revises its Apollo moon exploration schedule, cancelling the 20th Apollo mission due in 1975 before it was even planned. And then they also plan to shove Apollos 13 through 16 by the end of 1971 and then launch the Skylab space station before returning to some more Apollo missions in 1973 and 1974. Thus, the space exploration, having achieved putting a man on the moon, is promptly brought back down to Earth by politics. Uh, much reflecting the current season of Doctor Who, you know, season seven, being brought that back down to Earth with a change of format. Ah, very good. As I say, given um, Nixon's tenure in the White House, his first term, focusing on more domestic projects, Having reaped the rewards of Americans landing on the moon, he's concentrating on other things. And NASA throughout season seven will see its budget promptly slashed by many millions of dollars. I think we should put a little bracket around this one. And when we get to the ambassadors of death and the British Space Agency, or whatever it's called, we can put this all in the screen and laugh at it because it was stupid even back then. It's like the last episode of a meteorite landing to Earth. It was just very interesting timing for the Ambassadors of Death. But yes, that is all to come. On Wednesday the 7th of January, there's a war of attrition between Egypt and Israel. This is after the post-six-day war, which we covered in Season Forgotten. And this saw Israeli jets bomb Egypt. President Nasser he of uh, Suez Canal fame, went to Russia to request assistance. And soon, after a few Soviet scientists' deaths, they're going to send troops to coordinate anti-aircraft defence. Hmm, giant hegemonic superpowers in the Middle East. Now, where have we heard that before? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting that the time that we have a story of an alien threat infiltrating British society, we see the real-life alien threat of the Soviet Union extending its influence in a former Western allied country. Mm. And we're, we're going to talk about a lot about alien threats and alien invasions and subversions and government takeovers and conspiracies and all that in this episode. Again, fantastic that it's happening 50 years ago and in the episode and now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can definitely say that there's a infiltration going on now, perhaps. Maybe. Tinfoil hat time. Mm -hmm. Yes. As your sound diminishes to that of a robot. That was interesting. And finally, on the same day, the well-known television show Hawaii Five-O airs the episode Bored She Hung Herself, which is a controversial episode, to say the least, in which a girl is murdered by erotic asphyxiation. And after a viewer quote, dies trying the same technique, unquote, the show has never been repeated ever. Oh, American society. So what I like about this is, I don't remember exactly what the show was called, but I watched something that was on ITV in the late 60s, and at the very beginning of it, they showed a playing card with a girl's breast on it. So there's an increased amount of titillation you can get away with on television in this sort of time period. And I like that it's it's not gone right for them. And they're now basically embroiled in this massive litigation suit. And that episode only came out in the Blu-ray edition, which was a few years ago. It was the only time you could get hold of it. 
So that's how protective they are of some of the aired in 1970. And so what we can see is that TV, even back then, was something that could get you massively, massively, massively sued. Yes. And uh, I'm pretty sure that Doctor Who might have the same thing if ever they find the Celestial Toy Maker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Right. <laughs> Such, such is the problem with television 50 years ago, but not necessarily now. That's the point of the podcast. That was the news. And now we shall get into Spearhead from Space, episode two, aired the 10th of January, 1970. This one, which I called in the preamble a facsimile of events or elements on the first one, because it fleshes out, which is a bad choice of words, the autons. Drones of a consciousness invading the Earth who can look like you. And as we talked about with um, the Six Day War and the Russians, um, government conspiracies and alien invasions through subversion are a useful plot in sci-fi. Yes, especially as we go into the 70s and we get a lot of Cold War stuff going on. It's in one of its heights, given it's Brezhnev and the other one. Oh, Bulgarian, there we go. Bulgarian probably didn't have the right facial hair to be memorable. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, for an episode where basically nothing happens, it's still surprisingly engaging. And the story cares so little about the Doctor that presumably his regeneration sickness was to keep the story going and fit it all in. I don't think you'd be able to get that nowadays because there's too much of a hype around it. This episode very much follows on from the next and that it's still much more interested in fleshing out the new status quo of Unit and Liz. And the, the Doctor is still only being slowly fitted into this picture and he's not actually going to, you know, he's not interacting too much with that just yet. When they're more interested in establishing what we're going with forwards because Liz is our entry point character. And so... In a sense, she, she's the first character that we like in this serial. She's the first and arguably the only likable character at this point. Absolutely. So that's could be thought of as a bit of a departure from earlier companions. Why, why are you rolling your eyes? Oh, yeah, because every companion in the 60s was just uh, screaming girls. No. Victoria has a lot to answer for. Oh, Right, look, all right, I know, but still, I'm just trying, that's why I, I didn't name names, and I was saying, as a general. As a general thing, that's wrong. It's not wrong. It is. And now that argument is over, my thoughts on the episode. I have a sneaking and worrying suspicion that this is going to be talking rooms in Earth in colour which is going to be one of the few differentiations. As Luke and Nick have pointed out, um, plot has um, advanced itself at a glacial pace, and mainly through um, not action, but talking. But, hey, that's, that's 70s television for you. Well, what's interesting about that is you can sort of talk about a wacky ambition the 60s who had... As opposed to this uh, this 70s realism of, look, this is all we've got. Let's just use it to our, our greatest advantage. So let's bring the alien threat to Earth. Let's make it sort of recognisable to the public in the form of plastics, in the form of mannequins and in the form of alien governments trying to take over. Black and white was one of Doctor Who's greatest friends, because when everything's in black and white and it's supposed to be seen on some scummy television then a lot of the faults are well hidden. When you're in black and white, and especially in Spearhead from Space, when you're shooting in film, although that wasn't part of the script, obviously, if it looked rubbish and a bit cranky, it would show up to all hell. And so the fact that it is people talking in rooms is kind of living within its means. It also shows how beige the 70s were. So let's look at this beige episode in more detail, shall we? So, having been shot, the Doctor's right back in the hospital with another coma, self-induced this time. Ooh, alien. The Brig gets the TARDIS back to his HQ and investigates a broken plastic meteorite before wondering where the man in the suit comes from. Cue a plastics factory. 
the hideout of a man in the suit. We see industry. Remember when Britain had industry 50 years ago? Nah, me neither. But what it does bring up is the what people see is as industry point. Because at this stage of post-war history, post white heat of technological revolution, Britain's relationship with industry is rocky, to say the least. What with late 60s trade union strikes and all that. So for subversive aliens to take over an industry, this would no doubt play on the fears of evil trade is evil? Or am I being paranoid about that? Yeah, perhaps you're being slightly paranoid, but also there is some foundation to it because you know, trade unionists they often were influenced by uh, certain left-wing governments of the world and are often uh, cracked down on because of uh, their left leanings which could leave them vulnerable to being influenced by other states, perhaps even infiltrated by an alien threat. Mm. As is the case in this Doctor Who episode, and as is the case for all rumour mills 50 years on. What I quite like about this plastics montage is essentially in 1976, plastic becomes the most used material in the world. In 1959, you got Barbie unveiled. It is showing how widespread plastic is. But the thing is, is that this bit is only really put in this part of the episode. There's no real massive plastic presence in the rest of it, right? And so the Autons are, they're not a story about plastics. They're more a story about infiltration. But it's using the plastics as a sci-fi veneer so as to not make it too obvious and, you know, drop an anvil on your head that it's about infiltration. Exactly. And when you do make it about plastics, you get Terror of the Autons, which is marvellous, marvellous schlock. This isn't schlock, this is serious. A little bit about our our little constitutional situation at the moment. Um, The B word, as it were. The man talks about selling his, you know, hawking his wares to the United States. He doesn't say Europeans or Australians or the Commonwealth. He says the Americans. So this is interesting that we already had this fixation on to be big, you've got to go to America. Europe wasn't necessarily on our minds. A lot of the British public's minds. Yes, because at this point in in the late stages of the 20th century, consumerism equals America, if only because they were the main principle for consumerism in Britain in the late 1950s, rise of commercial television and all that, just as there is a post-war economic boom, and China is being um, slightly violent at the moment, so they're not going to get into their industrial phase just yet. That's industry for you, 50 years ago to now. Moving on. The man in the suit has taken over the plastics factory. Lovely. Liz conducts experiments on the meteorite, which is in fact manufactured from space. She and the brig spar wonderfully over aliens and the doctor, the brig looking more foolish despite knowing the truth. But it's that blend of science, fantasy and realism that we've got there. There's a space meteorite, but it's made from plastic, so instantly in the minds of the British public. It's an alien scientist, but he looks a bit like a dandy and sounds like the guy from the Navy Lark. There's a general there as well. He'll be important to the plot later on. So Scooby comes in and is immediately dismissive towards uh, Liz, because he's just a stereotypical pompous old man. And she's quite able to swap that away because she's, you know, a competent scientist who happens to just be a woman, you know, it doesn't matter that she's a woman. And looning a little bit back to that argument we had to fade out, sure, this is not the first time there's a strong female character in Doctor Who who has been a companion, but this is the first time it's in such a realistic setting. She does a real job. So let's say Zoe was, you know, a strong companion who was a woman, but she's from the future and she doesn't look like someone of today. But here we have someone from the present day who looks like someone dressed as someone from the present day, doing a real recognisable job at a real recognisable institution, and she's being shown to be very competent, which I think is a bit more of a, if not an absolute first, more more of a first. The man in the suit is trying to locate these energy units, the meteorites, like the one the poacher has, which he's hiding from his put-upon wife. These are being hunted down in the forest 
by autonomous plastic shop window mannequins. Hmm, perhaps we should call them dum-dums. As in dummies? No? Okay. But the point of this is that they are a manifest fear of humanity. Hear me out. We hate difference, but we also hate complete similarities. So identical twins. Ugh, what's up with that? But seriously, though, you point it in the mirror and we'll go, ah, they're too alike. Kill them with fire. The uncanny valley that can kill. Interesting. The interesting thing about the Autons, I said last week that the colour isn't really used in this particular story, but the Autons are flesh coloured. If you were to have this in black and white, you wouldn't get nearly the same effect because now they look like us. And when they take over General Scobie, you can see that sheen on them, that sheen of flesh that really makes them look like him. Also, if you compare these to the robots in the previous season, you know, you've got the quarks, you've got those um, stompy things at the beginning of the mind rubber, and to an extent you've got the cyber planner and the cybermen. And now we have a complete departure from that. That is really hammering the point home. It's not just that they're uncanny valleys. After all that's come before, and in fact what comes later, you don't really get stompy robots in Doctor Who for a while after this point. The Doctor escapes from the hospital, showering and stealing clothes in a car because he needs an identity from somewhere. Mmm, comedy. Unit find a meteorite and the Auton hunts them down. Blood and murder ensues, which is a nice tonal twist to show how adult this kid's show can be. Especially because the way the Auton kills them is by looking just at them you know it doesn't storm towards them it just sort of stands in the middle of the road and they swerve to avoid it its weapon is that it looks like you and it makes you panic well and and it's using the innate goodness of humans to not want to hurt other humans to its advantage which is all the more scary um, than just shooting you in the face although they do shoot you in the face (laughs) yeah (laughs) thank you for reminding us of the positive nature of humanity nick (laughs) <laughs> I think it was something sorely lacking in this episode till now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Isn't it nice? Soldiers don't want to run over a person, so they swear. No, so so maybe even 50 years ago, soldiers knew that get a bad rap from doing something really bad. Oh, we could link that to the Vietnam War, can't we? Let's not. Let's leave that. <laughs> OK, carry on. <laughs> um, so another interesting point about this is so lab coat doctor man who always has his hands in the pockets he decides to call in an expert someone an even more senior doctor than him probably from carnaby street or something judged by the way he's dressed he comes down the senior doctor and how is he dressed he's not dressed as a you know a doctor you normally expect a doctor to be uh, in a lab coat or whatever white coat he's dressed with this wonderful velvet cloak he's got this nice black fedora hat he's got a cane he, he looks very very wealthy and it's interesting that the more authoritative and respected figure is someone who's intensely wealthy or at least presents themselves that way more so than what you could argue is the middle class uh, lab coat doctor man let's call him proto doctor or proto pertwee proto pertwee's demeanor is very blustery and Oh, this can't be. I can't. I've got to see. Oh, where, where, where have you put it, lab coat doctor man? His patients run away. And so you're not really supposed to respect it. The fact that the doctor steals this man's identity and his blustery nature down to his clothes and his hat. He's become a facsimile of this blustery doctor man. <laughs> oh, my God. It's, yeah. it's it's the theme of this episode. He needed an identity from somewhere, so he borrowed it from him. Yes, well, and and it shows that the Doctor prefers an upper class identity. But by stealing from the upper class as well, he doesn't necessarily show respect for them. So he's an upper class rebel. It would have been even more horrific if the comparisons continued and the Carnaby Street Doctor man came out and got run over by his own car. <laughs> 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 but yeah that was probably a bit too far for robert holmes in 1970 yeah you'd have to wait until 1971 for that there's something for big finish revenge of the carnaby street doctor played by mark gattis of course it was of course <laughs> it is why wouldn't it be god damn 
bless that man in the Inverness cape. Right. The Doctor hightails it to his TARDIS, Unit HQ and the Brigadier, because he has a TARDIS detecting watch, which we never see again. Ah, uh, never mind. And thus, the amnesiac Doctor meets the Brig and Liz and learns of the meteorites. We establish a rapport and start the plot of the episode at the same time. I quite like that he's got a watch there. You know, it's very James Bondy and will kind of set the tone of things to come. Not that you didn't have, you know, wacky gadgets up to this point, but it's good to see a gadgety watch. I'm glad that it's just running with it. Hmm. So you, you can see how from alien to Earth in the past seven years of Doctor Who, the most the most alieny thing that the first Doctor has is an astrolabe and a magic ring. The second Doctor has stuff all over the place, including eventually the sonic screwdriver, which is a bit more down to earth because it's sort of a screwdriver. At first. Well, doesn't it resonate concrete in episode four of The Dominators or something? Uh. It's sort of that plus explosive charges to break through a hole in the wall. Right. I don't know. I haven't watched The Dominators in a long time for a good reason. <laughs> and now the third Doctor has his, for want of a better term, smart watch. That's one of a much better term, I must say. Yeah, I, I, I tried my very best to get away from any branded products <laughs> at that point. But don't worry, I'm sure they'll find a way to kill us in a future Doctor Who episode. <laughs> <laughs> These watches, they're all showing us the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's late. You mean the Y2K virus, <laughs> which basically started because they started on digital time on the 1st of January, 1970. <gasps> yeah, I thought I'd finally get that in at some point. Excellent. So this is the first scene where the Doctor and Liz meet. And what's important is that We've established Liz as the only real likable character here at this point for the audience. And what we see is she and the Doctor immediately get on and the Doctor starts, treats her nicely as opposed to Scobie or the Brigadier, who's been a bit terse with her as well. So we are now let in by Liz to liking the Doctor. Now we know he's on our side as well because we're on Liz's side and he's on Liz's side. And finally, towards the end of the episode, the unemployed man who lost his job because the aliens took over the plastics factory, who keep up, trespasses his way back into the plastics factory, who were making a mannequin of General Scobie, remember him, working with Unit. So the unemployed man makes his way back into the control room that was once his workshop and finds a mannequin which comes to life and stalks him with a gun for a hand. And thus is... Quote unquote evil industry and aliens taking over and using all our lovely bits of industry for evil purposes. They have seized the means of production. Yes. Oh. But no. Shh. So I had to make that joke. Yeah. No, you did have to. Well done, Nick. What I quite like about this is that the unit era begins with a bunch of disposable soldiers as the enemy, which I think is quite fitting because we're going to have a bunch of disposable soldiers in the unit years. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like how we see the foot soldiers before we see the nesting and the big bad at the heart of the story, the nesting consciousness, isn't some giant <laughs> that, uh, slobbers into the story leaving slime everywhere not the doctor who can afford this but i do like how it's focusing on the smaller more horrific idea as opposed to going to any spectacle and i think that's a really good use of the fact that doctor who had no money this is sort of mirrored with the unit because not the first soldier that we see from unit is not the brigadier we see the little people there as well well you're thinking of episode one in episode one, we see. Yeah, I know, one. but I'm just saying is it's mirrored in the serial. And you've got, uh, well, if you refer to like the invasion or the web of fear, where we actually see the first unit people. Fine, don't bother me. He's just not going to let me make the. Thus ends an episode which shows off an alien invasion taking over the means of production, taking real points 
and I am adding a healthy dose of paranoid fears of shop window dummies in industry. There's that point of sci-fi and realism that I feel we come to expect in Doctor Who in the 1970s. Thank you very much for listening. You can find us on Blogspot, which redirects to iTunes. Leave positive comments there, it helps. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube, where you can like, comment and subscribe, and Google+, Plus, if that's still a thing. I don't know. We shall be back next week with episode three of Spearhead and Space, with probably a little bit more arguing as well. Until then, I have been Ben. I have been Luke. And I have been Nick. Oh, have you? Oh, have you? Thank you, and goodbye.